Hey guys, Henning and Morten from Flip Normals here. In this very special episode, we are now sitting at uh, the Foundry headquarters in London, along with Rory Woodford, who is the product manager. Of That's Mari. correct. Yes. Yes. Uh, Rory, the product manager of Mari. Uh, to Hi, Rory. Hey, Rory. Hey guys. How's it going? Good. Pretty good. Uh, we are going to be showing or Rory rather is going to be showing us some of the new cool features in the last few years of Mari. Uh, Mari is, for those who don't know, one of the the premier texturing software is out there, and this is what we've been using for years in VFX as well. So, take it away. Yeah, so, um, first of all, for those who are unfamiliar with Mari, I just want to quickly step through some of the basics. So, uh, Mari is, a, is Foundry's uh, very powerful 3D painting application, where we've kind of brought together uh, technology and artist-friendly workflows to bring a really great painting solution for all of your painting needs. So Mari works a little differently to other paint applications in the way that it kind of has this virtual piece of glass which uh, sits in front of your model. This is what we call a paint buffer. So instead of painting directly on the object itself, you're sort of painting on this, uh, on this piece of glass here. So if I just uh, get a paintbrush going on the correct channel, there we go. This is allows you to get a really good performance instead of taking everything to the model right away. Yeah, so this essentially allows you to paint on this kind of floating piece of glass that kind of uh, shows you what it'll look like when it actually gets down to your UVs. If I have a quick look over here at the auto UV view, you'll see that I have the UVs on my right, and this kind of has multiple patch edoms, so about seven of them here, and as I paint around here, you can see how it affects, uh, it'll show you preview where it's going to land. So you can do this on any scale, it has some great, uh, great options if uh, you go to like grab an image, reference image, you can um, paint this with the uh, paint through tool, which essentially is a way of pr uh, projecting a reference image onto the paint buffer. Uh, with my other guys, that kind of shows you where it's going to land. But since it's on this paint buffer, you can use these like two these two dimensional tools, like our warp tool, and do two dimensional operations. So if you don't quite like where your paint is landing, uh, based on where the geometry is, you can adjust this paint before you commit it down to, to the actual layer. You hit a bake, and that then performs the bake operation, and then it's attached, and it's on there. This paint through tool has basically been my life for the last four <laughs> years. Paint through and warp tool, and that's it. Yeah. One cool thing you're showing here as well is that you can you can paint over multiple UDIMs, which just allows you to have crazy resolution. Imagine if fill might be over like legit a thousand UDIMs, which is insane, and then you can just paint over all of them. Yeah, so I mean, so it's essentially how it works. So if we go over here to the painting palette, we have the paint buffer sitting here, and this can uh, control uh, the, the buffer size, it's kind of the piece of glass, and that can go up to 16K, depending on how much uh, video memory you have in your graphics card, and that has all of your high res paint. Uh, in the background, though, all the all the layers that you can stack up. So this project is quite small; it has two layers at the moment. But you can have many, many layers, completely non-destructively kept here. And uh, depending on the on the amount of RAM your graphics card has, it creates this kind of virtual texture where it uses various maps and curve techniques to give you a preview of all of your paints live while you're painting your high res. And your background might not be the high res, but it's still a good context. But when it bakes it down. It bakes everything down at the highest resolution, so it keeps all the definition and uh, fidelity to your paint. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, let me just uh, touch on a few other things. So the basic uh, project workflow here is once you start your project, which actually, should I just do a quick, um, I'll come back to this project in a second. Sure. Yeah, let me just do a new project to show how you start. Cool, so um, to start a project in Mari, uh, we essentially, in Mari 4, with the, uh, with the upgrade to VFX Reference Platform 2017, we, uh, we took the advantage of having to switch to the new QT to give our whole UI a refresh, mm -hmm. and also address uh, the areas which uh, we had got lots of customer feedback that Mari kind of hard to get started with the project and then hard to get out of the project. Yeah. So we took these, uh, these two areas into focus in the 4 series. So this is the new project dialogue, or the new new project dialogue. <laughs> From here, you select your object, I'll take this robot here, and then we have these channel presets, which essentially give you a good starting point for the uh, channels that you want to uh, you start your project with. So we come with some uh, presets here, 
where you can face off the Unreal VFX uh, V-Ray nice. Crispy ODF, a couple of uh, different uh, notations like metallic, non-metallic games will set, start slightly off at uh, 2K. And uh, these can be uh, created uh, from scratch here, or you can import them if you have uh, uh, existing sequences you want to bring in. So if you ha have from a previous project you've exported and you try and start one new. Got that. Then over our color settings, this is where our color management system is set up. So normally, uh, by default, we have our new default setup, which is your kind of standard uh, eight-bit sRGB kind of uh, color space uh, setup. We do have uh, we ship a version of Asus. So if you're working in television or film where the, uh, the whole pipeline works on the Asus CG based pipeline, mm -hmm. we have that set up here. So It'll uh, automatically interpret your your eight bit images uh, from the web as the correct sRGB, but your working space will be uh, in Asus CG. Uh, I'm gonna switch back to uh, new default here, and then we have a new lighting palette uh, uh, pane where you can pick a nice HDRI and get your lighting started up so that uh, before in Mari when you start a project, it it was kind of, it kind of made you go through a lot of steps yourself to. Uh, Kind of set it up. So if I just go to HDRIs, I've got some great HDRIs here. I got from uh, HDRI Haven. I just really like this Table Mountain one because that's where I come from. Thank you, Sam. That's really nice. Represent. Uh, exactly. Uh, so once all that goes, one of the new things with Mario 4 is since I've selected these channels against this uh, this preset, which is based on Pencil 3 df uh, once the project's created, it'll actually create the shader and plug in those channels into the shader for you. So when the project starts, you have a, a full uh, PBR based shader ready, hooked up, and uh, representative of what your final paints look like. Ah, so you don't need what, to go in and like so all the channels and everything. Exactly. Okay. So you don't need to go digging in all our palettes, nice. setting up the lights, setting up the channels. We kind of do a lot of that now for you to start out, re reducing the amount of start time it, it was required before. That's awesome. That's also been my life for the last four years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> start in our project, set up the lights, set up all the shaders. Connect uh, the right shaders. Correct the right shaders, screw up the right shader, yeah. and then redo it. So uh, th this is this is a huge addition just for uh, making Mari smarter. Yeah, exactly. just really, it's just really nice. reducing the amount of artist clicks required to get their job done. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so what we introduced in the four series is the side, uh, the side palette uh, toolbar. So essentially, this is where you can get access to all of your all the power of Mari. So start looking at the channels palette here. This is where all of your channels are kind of uh, managed. Uh, with Mari four one, we introduced uh, these nice little uh, color indications to say if the uh, if the channel is for color versus if it's for scalar. So throughout Mari, this kind of concept of scalar is really important. Mm. Scalar in Mari means not color, which essentially tells Mari, do not do any kind of color management to it. It's kind of a naught to one or beyond floating point data. So this is your normal channels, your roughness, your specular, yeah. anything which isn't based on human perception of what a color should be, you need to tag for scalar. And in the channels palette, it's really simple. You just go down to the options where it has color space, a tag scaler on or off. And that's all done automatically now, right? With the presets, that all yeah. sets up for you automatically, yeah. Very nice. Uh, so, if I go to the color channel here, here's the, the layers palette, and this is essentially where you start uh, kind of stacking up your layers. So, you can start here uh, with a paint layer. This, let's do some paint tool, can start painting on this as, as before, or you can add uh, various procedurals. Let's take that down. So you can add uh, things like uh, procedural cloud, maybe a fractal cloud. Uh, this is just your everyday uh, fractal cloud. It's now applied to the color channel. And here you have all the live options where you can change the uh, kind of the size, the roughness. Done. That's it, guys. That's you for awesome. <laughs> That's how we and, and now we have a wonderful metallic robot. Um, beyond that. Uh, what the tilt, uh, palace toolbar is, uh, it's got these great uh, options to kind of pop out and fade away. So if you need to come in, do a slight adjustment, and go uh, like if you want to go completely patches selected, kind of select these and uh, do various operations in that world. I think this is selected. Sorry, yeah. So you can do patch selections here, kind of go back and uh, do slight operations like that. So Examples of your layers palette, all these guys were closed. 
and you want to work on your full canvas, uh, you can go to your layers palette and uh, I just want to adjust that uh, size a little bit and then uh, get back to the painting. I love the addition of the toolbar. It's just, it, it helps, really helps with the clutter, I think. Yeah, it's that's right. So our main goal was to kind of declutter the toolbar, to declutter the canvas. So yeah. before Mari 3, that all the toolbars are so chunky and had all this margin space and the UI, just the real estate was just so cluttered. Yeah. So our whole goal with the 4 Series, with the, uh, the, the upgrade uh, to QT5 uh, was to use the opportunity to this, this just readdress mm. all of our palettes and get all this, this clutter out the way so you can just focus on your, on your painting image. Like we talked about before, it's like it's always, Mar is always on two screens. Like you have to. Two, two monitors. monitors well, you Mar. had to. You and had that, to. that has been our, our legacy uh, issues. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so much control that uh, you want to have access to our power, and, yeah. but you kind of were forced to have two screens. So now with the palace toolbar and the, uh, the collapsing palettes, it just makes it all a little bit more uh, mm. accessible. The interface is very scary now. This is something we talked about a bit before recording, but a lot of people are afraid of Mari, just because it used to be a bit scary. Uh, Mari was Mari was essentially developed in uh, like for Avatar, as far as I know. And um, that's right. So it was, it was developed uh, at Weta uh, while they're working on King Kong, I believe. Oh, okay. And uh, it's the, the essentially the, the the kind of birth of Mari was uh, trying to find they had had an engineering problem. They were painting King Kong and painting the, the toenail and then they had to go paint the next toenail but they couldn't see that detail in context of the whole creature so they went uh, they, they like put their heads together kind of came up with this concept of using a paint buffer system where you're, you're you're painting on this piece of glass but then it can project down onto as many items as possible mm -hmm. and then have that uh, the virtual texture give you that context so you could paint on the toenail or you could paint a, a gradient across the entire creature and just goes bakes down to all your hundred plus items very simply. So what's the advantage of having a paint buffer versus painting live on like a mesh, for example? The advantage is simply the scale, is you can paint across uh, uh, multiple patches, multiple items, without having to worry about seams, and just based on a projection-based painting system that allows that scale yeah. and that versatility. As well as the, uh, as I touched on before, with the, the warping tools, the 2D tools, you can do all these, uh, all these actions and have, have your paint staged. So especially when using um, when using images as reference before you uh, uh, bake a map down, you can get that kind of staged look and kind of assess how it, how it looks from uh, different lighting positions with the geometry without, and uh, then make a call before it bakes down. So mm -hmm. that is a definite advantage. So if you're doing like if you're doing a digital double, so I don't have a one for example here, but if you're having a digital double, you'd have a face and you want to line that up with your uh, your geometry, with your nose, lined yeah, up with yeah, the yeah. ear. Like sometimes the reference photography doesn't match the model exactly. Having to warp, to it warp a bit those and, projected yeah. images around before bake down is incredibly powerful. You you, you basically need that. You yeah. need that. You need that feature. Precisely. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, going to quickly just jump over here to uh, the view transform, which is the uh, toolbar here, which uh, is kind of where our color management is worked out. So here we have this little indicator here, which we've added in 4.1, which this indicates that currently this uh, the view is being color managed. So since we're in the new default, this is oh, just that's nice. It's yeah, <laughs> it's like this. This is this is pretty neat. This we released this in the, in our June release of yeah. 4, 4.1 and 3.4. So depending on what you're looking at, right now I'm looking at the uh, a full shaded image, so I can switch it here to current channel. So on the left hand side are all the kind of project control states. So the tools are up here for your paintbrush, your current color. And down here are these control states, so the current selection mode, uh, the current uh, shader, the lighting condition. This is our mirror projection painting, which I'll get into a little bit later. Ooh. Very exciting. <laughs> and uh, our old mirror, our uh, paint buffer based mirror painting. So here I'm in a current channel, so if I just uh, switch off the, uh, the thing F1 there, basically switching the lighting to flat. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just pause here, I'm going to jump to a project where I actually have color. Mm -hmm. So, well, just give me a second and I'll get back to you. All right. That's a bit more like it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So here we have a like, nice colorful version of this uh, beautiful model. This is all flattened out. So all the channels are just uh, currently single layer, but it's a good way of, of describing the, uh, the color management system. So here we're looking at uh, base color. So switch that mask and switch the, uh, the current shader, which is the user shader, which is currently our principal really F, switch the current channel. This is all the color. Go F1 to get rid of the lighting. 
or switch the socket here. And uh, let me just uh, temporarily turn off the uh, the background so you can kind of see what it looks like without this nice, beautiful background at home. There we go. So this is color managed. If I turn off the view transform here, this is actually how the data is mm. kind of recorded. It's all it's in sRGB linear. So kind of that's the raw data, but you want to see it on your uh, computer monitor, and they tend to be sRGB. Uh, calibrated monitors. And you can do this if you have like a film LUT or something as well. Then That's you can right. On. So you can have a film LUT uh, in, in the OCI config can be added or you can actually point it to a specific LUT. Because there's nothing worse than having painted and managed all your textures and now there's all of a sudden there's a LUT on top. And yeah. That's right. If, if you've been afraid of LUTs before or color management, this just makes everything so much easier. Yeah. Like everything we've shown so far, like there are a lot of settings here and particularly we're opening up the project window, there are a lot of new scary things. Basically, you just click OK. <laughs> you just click You just click default, default, go, and then you're ready to start your project. I just want to reiterate that. Mari is, if you've been using Mari beforehand, it, it's a lot easier now. It's a lot more intuitive. Yeah. And that's like that's been one of their major focuses with the, the last few releases. And it, it really is it really is a lot easier to set up. Yeah. So it's essentially like all the power is there to extend, but we don't obviously, uh, you don't need to use everything. Yeah. If you just want to paint your model simply. So here I've just applied a uh, an extra grade LUT. So this is like your show LUT. I selected it from the hard drive. It's just a, a grade that I've made in Nuke using their CMS tool set. Kind of do a bit of a color grade overlay. And that can be applied on top of the sRGB LUT. Okay. So if you have that show LUT as well, you can kind of use, yeah, yeah. use that in conjunction with your OCI config. So with this extra LUT option, you can actually pick an additional grade on top of the sRGB. So now the important thing is the scalar data. So if I move over to my roughness channel here, you'll see that this indicator switched from a color indicator mm. to a black and white indicator. This now means that we're using the kind of the, the scalar non-color managed uh, monitor. So right here, we see this is switched to a none as far as the, uh, the viewer. And if you see if I switch uh, back between a color and a non-color, that swaps between the two settings. Yeah. So we essentially have two monitors, a monitor for your color data and a monitor for your uh, scalar data, which means that uh, if, you're, if you're working in a, a large uh, team of artists and you, have, you want to have complete control on how you view these two things, they're completely separate yeah. comparable things. Uh, but what's important here is this allows your, uh, your color, the, the, what the, the monitor displays for your scalar data to be perceptually linear. So that means if you're painting a, uh, a gradient, say, if I just go to my gradient tool here, Nobody knows about the gradient tool. <laughs> it's, it's one of these hidden little gems. They all, you don't have to do this so often when you're doing masks and stuff. Nobody knows about it. It's awesome. You do a tutorial just on the gradient tool. <laughs> yeah. So here, let me just add a quick little layer here so I don't destroy this nice pink below. So this this has the, from white to black, it's nice mid-gray in the middle. And you don't, you just, beforehand, you would see that as this kind of really bright gamma curve. And it was, really tricky for artists to kind of understand what mid-gray is, mm. especially if you come from a, a, another a, a painting application where, uh, for example, your, your normal data, like everyone who's painted game maps and normals know what the default normal blue looks like, so that, that proper shade yeah. of, uh, of blue. So if I just go here and uh, create a quick channel, I'll call this normals, and uh, make sure I've set this to scalar. And switch here, get rid of this tool. I like how visual it is with the uh, with the little icon. That you're you're yeah. never in doubt whether you're yeah. on a scalar channel or so that was before channel. our issue was that you would look at the, the channel palette and you yeah. would have to click each one to see what their color space setting was. Yeah. Now having it indicated there on the palette makes it a whole lot simpler. Uh, so here we go. Uh, if I add a uh, procedural color for normal, you can kind of pick that. 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, 0
Yeah, so there's a, a great little thing. Let me show you quickly if I switch this over to uh, the full shader. Now, go over here to the, uh, the shaders palette. This is where you control the uh, shaders for Mari. And I'm just going to plug in the normal channel into my shader. So it's a simple uh, pop up here, shows all the available channels. Now this is hooking it up. Uh, so currently this is blue, so it's just going to look uh, kind of the same. Uh, any other color I paint here is going to look really, really odd. If I uh, go to a paintable layer, there's some really weird stuff. But there, there is a method to this madness using the normal channel. I can switch this to current channel and not use the normal colors, but instead just use uh, simple black and white. So here, if I just go and create another fractal procedural, nice little cloud here, and give it a bit of setting here and add an adjustment layer. So in our layers palette, we have paint layers where you paint, you add your, your hand painted uh, masks, uh, uh, more data, sorry. Uh, we've got the procedurals where you add things like clouds or tiled, uh, tiled maps from outside. Mm -hmm. We also have adjustment layers. Now these are things for like grading, adjusting colors, uh, a whole bunch of a variety of things. What I want to show you here is the height is normal. This will basically tell, uh, read the black and white data below this uh, this layer and convert it to a normal map. Is this one new in Mari, or have I just missed no, that forever? This has been around, yeah. <laughs> I have just missed that forever. And it's got like a, a weight here, oh, you can nice. adjust the bump weight, and then uh, uh, interesting feature we added recently is the uh, the bump space to so switch from UV to world in case you have mm. uh, UVs which are different slight, slightly different areas mm -hmm. so this will allow you to uh, kind of just tune it across everything so if I go back to my full shader here you'll see now this thing's gonna look really bumpy so here nice. we go it's really shattering that light. It looks really cool. And you can go back to the cloud and adjust your, uh, adjust your settings. It's all still completely live. And add a paint layer and just say, oh, I just want to paint some up. So uh, every time you add a new layer, Mari essentially recalculates the shader so that it can be live. So that's where you get the little spinning wheel. And we did some work in the 3 series where we uh, essentially had two versions of the shader, one that, uh, that uh, requires less recompilations and one that, that kind of has a higher frame rate. So when you're working at Mari from 3.3 and beyond, you would have, uh, you would see that uh, you, your amount of compilation should reduce over time. Mm. So yeah, we'll just do this over the, over this nice little uh, bit here. Here's an up, X to switch to your other color, and here's some down. And then bake that in, and then there you go. There's, there's your kind of painting or height. It's really cool I can do this. This is something I've been doing a lot as well, even for characters. Like if you want to add like a little wrinkle or a pimple or something to your character, really control it. Instead of taking a C brush where you might not have enough resolution, you can do it like this just to really get the sharpness. Or I guess for like decals or all kind of crazy damage you can do for hard surface. Yeah. This is probably a great approach for that. It's so much easier to get resolution on maps than yeah. it's like polygons and sculpting it <laughs> yeah. so yeah uh, so that's that's a uh, kind of just a quick breakdown of a few of these things um, Super cool. uh, let's see where I can go now let me let me quickly introduce you to uh, our wonderful mirror projection system that we added in oh, yes. 4.2 that's uh, the most exciting thing <laughs> <laughs> I am very excited with that so let me just get my image manager up here and see if I've got any textures kicking around no nope. let me just uh, there we go. So, before in Mari, if you wanted to paint uh, the same image on two sides of the same model, you essentially need to do a lot of work uh, in your UV space mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, you had perfectly symmetrical UVs. And you'd have to kind of go through the system where you'd pick one patch, copy it, paste it to another, yeah. and do a flip operation. It just was a lot of, a lot of manual steps. So in Mari 4.2, we introduced the mirror projection system. Like essentially, the way our UVs were managed was dictated by how we would paint in Mari yeah. before. That's which, right. Which yeah. we have a tutorial on. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so here you go. So just uh, since you're painting in the buffer here on the right hand side, this is by default, uh, the system is off. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, if we go here on the left hand side, we have this new little indicator here, which is which uh, the current setting for the mirror projection. Let's switch this over to X. And now it's going to quickly compile the shader with an additional projection angle, which is going to be uh, mirrored down the X plane. And not like how it was before, based on the paint buffer, sort of like screen mirror projection. So it's not like the previous system where it would, yeah, exactly right. So that is still available. Let me just go over here to the painting palette and tell it to stop blocking out my paint with the mask preview. <laughs> is, we, is this currently available, or is this? This is out. This this came cool. out uh, this this the September. Okay. So I'll go to the mirror projection palette uh, uh, panel here. Currently, we're masking dynamically, and I'll just turn that off. Nice. And uh, so yeah, so just quickly touch on what uh, uh, Morton was saying is we have the old system. So if I switch this off go to uh, painting in mirror X, there's a very thin uh, line down the middle here, which essentially allows you to paint an X and Y of the paint buffer. This is kind of, it's, ha it's, very, it's very handy if you're doing things, if, you, if you're painting whoops, directly down the center of the, uh, of the model, but it only works if, you're, if, you're, if it's completely aligned perfectly to the center yeah, of the, yeah. of the uh, canvas. But what it's, it's advantage is, uh, is good for is if you're wanting to do things like um, of tattoo designs and whatnot. Yeah, it's really cool for creating specific patterns. You can yeah. really, you can really create a lot of cool stuff. For so it. just move this. Uh, it's just not super useful for most things. Yeah. Has this been your most highly requested feature? It's been one of our <laughs> longest standing <laughs> requested features. So that, that this is what it's really good for. Is yeah. doing these kind of cool Rorschach patterns. Exactly. On your robot. <laughs> <laughs> On your robot. <laughs> So if I switch this off and go to the mirror projection system, one of the things with all these guys is you can control click to cycle through it. Mm. Ah, cool. nice. And uh, let me just make this a little bit more obvious because do they work in conjunction with each other? Mirror painting and the you paint can work? really yeah, absolutely. Okay. So you want to have like some cool uh, tattoo which is on both yeah, left yeah, and right yeah. arms? Okay. Absolutely works together. Dangerous thinking, more <laughs> <laughs> Combining fuels here, we shouldn't be combining. <laughs> So here we go, I'm just going to go and uh, paint on here, and you see on the That's other side, awesome. it's absolutely mirrored. Ah, cool. So if I just move my paint buffer back over here. Oh yeah, so there's like a shortcut key M which moves your paint buffer. This is this, this is your virtual piece of glass. Yeah. yeah. You can see me moving it around here. And you know, reset that. This is going here. to save me so much trouble, because like we, we, we were just teaching this last week, now, yeah. how to get around this, where oh, your UVs needs to be done like this, and... Now you, you don't really have to worry about that anymore. That's exactly. cool. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's absolutely 100% the same paint buffer uh, projected from both sides. This allows you to do everything you currently do, Mari, but just from projection. And uh, one of our greatest uh, additions to the system is you can hook this onto a, uh, a locator. So, for example, here, if I uh, add a little plus button here to attach to, and click that. It gives me a locator, mm -hmm. uh, a little Peter Pickett. Oh, so you can set the, the uh, symmetry axis. You can set the symmetry axis. Uh, so here, if... Uh, very smart, Rory. This is strangely exciting. I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's because it's been, it's been like an issue we've been trying to solve for such a long time exactly. when we've been painting textures. So here, if I just want to zoom into this arm, say, and kind of just... So we had fights over this, fist yeah. fights, over <laughs> how we should do UVs for characters. So like, how, do, how does this work? Like, is it geometry based or like, how does it know where to paint? So it's, it's based on this plane. So there's a, a mirror plane kind of a virtual object, which yeah. you can kind of make non-virtual when you attach it to a locator, you get a control for it. As you kind of get like a paint buffer in the opposite direction of the, where you're painting on the opposite side of the plane. That's right. Okay. So it's, so if I go back to paint mode here, you see it represents the plane as a line that cuts uh, through the model. Okay. You can kind of see where the horizon cool. is. Yeah. And then here I'm painting on this side and it's painting on the left. Nice. In fact, the paint through tool, so it's something a little more interesting. So now I'm doing mirroring on a localized scale. Hmm. And uh, bunch, the, the other, other feature we added was the ability to mirror. So, sorry, to mask the mirror. So if I just uh, show you an example here, currently you get this uh, kind of overlap. Mm. Yeah. Where the one the one side is going over the other, so you have go to the masking section here, switch this on to dynamic. And this will essentially mask one side of the other. It's currently got the mask preview on, so I'll just tell that to toggle off because 
that's nice, nice, it's nice mirrored reflective edge mm. on your paints. So your proper ink blot wash off. Ah, okay. And uh, this will switch depending on what side of the mirror plane you're on <laughs> automatically. But if you're doing like the, if you if you about to reset this back to um, uh, back to default, and okay, I think we'll throw it out here. And if you want to paint on the other side of the leg, this isn't going to work because you're currently looking at the wrong yeah, side. Yeah. So you can actually hook this uh, the mirror masking to one side or the other, be it the positive oh. side, mm. all the negative. So things you're doing like on the inside of a room or something. And this way the uh, the masking is always on the positive sides of the axis that you have the mirror mask aligned against. Cool. Um, and uh, yeah, that basically wraps up our mirror projection system. We're very happy with. I wish we could talk about mirror projections all day. <laughs> <laughs> Let me quickly touch on uh, another thing we did in the four series, which was uh, a big change, is the exporting system. So before in Mari 3, if you wanted to export uh, your channels, you kind of had to uh, kind of right click and export selected or export all yeah. and go through like death by pop up window. <laughs> yep. True. True. <laughs> so uh, we introduced the export manager. And this essentially gives you a nice. Uh, spreadsheet uh, view of all of your channels and uh, it allows you to uh, specify a export target for each source and the power here is you can just do a standard uh, each source goes to one target but you can have more multiple targets for the same source so for example here you've got two base colors it'll tell you things like you've got two items which conflict with the location but you can say I actually want this to be a PNG and uh, I'd actually like that to be at uh, 512 uh, please as a proxy mm, um, very nice. and drop it to 8 bit because you can use support 16 and there we go and now we have two essential uh, export targets for the same data we also have over uh, global overrides which will allow you to do all of that uh, in one shot and uh, uh, the very powerful feature is the post process command so if you're dealing with third party render uh, render engines that require their own proprietary texture formats yeah. you can go in here and do a kind of conversion Command line using all this templating that we get available. Mm. So if you're uh, if you're tracking your channels with say uh, a job scene shot or something, you can add that as metadata to your channel, which, uh, and then that can be substituted in this line. So if you wanted to put it to a specific path, depending on what the metadata was, all this is available here, and we'll essentially run this in the command line after each export sequence. Yeah, so like you could you could add a tag here to convert to like text files or something. Else exactly with? right. Very nice. I'm strangely excited about Export Manager. <laughs> it's one of these things which it, it's, it's been kind of a pain to do, but uh, in the former versions, and if you can just go click. Exactly, and uh, every time you add any channel, it adds an initial uh, entry for this, so you don't have to kind of add it all yourself, and it does do a bit of that for you. Very cool. Which is great. All right. Great, now I want to show you guys a little sneak peek to what we have been working on at uh, Foundry. So. As we announced the Sigra, what our next big uh, piece of work that we're working towards is a material system. Mm. So let me walk you through our very, very early, early alpha <laughs> round trip of this. So uh, for materials, uh, they all start in the node graph. So we have to dig into the node graph here to get started. So what I first do is I go and say I want to create a material. Then there's a pop up here which tells you select a shader. So it's very important the whole material system. Is basically going to be driven around what shader you're using. So essentially, the shader dictates and drives what the shader inputs or channels are that you'll be using in your material. And uh, this will also help when actually applying materials to your projects. It will or, uh, it will tell Mari how to spread the material to your sibling channels. Kind of the shader at the end of the uh, of the of the, uh, of the network is essentially driving everything upstream. Yeah. So here I'm just going to use principal PRDF. This is our PBR based on the uh, Ben Berkeley paper from uh, Disney back in 2012. And I would say uh, create a shader network. I'm very excited to see this. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so uh, it just creates this uh, little network here. I'm just going to disconnect the displacement just for performance reasons now. <laughs> yeah, let's not kill your poor little laptop. <laughs> yeah, this is little M1000M is, uh, is trying very hard. <laughs> it's doing right. its best. So if I just display this in the, uh, the viewport, yeah, it's all good. Uh, double click the material and then I dive in. So in here, these are all the, uh, I'm zooming in, and uh, we have here is the base output, uh, metallic, 
sub, uh, subsurface uh, specular roughness, etc. So if I start off, go to uh, my image manager here, I'm just going to uh, collapse that there, go to my web browser, and take some images that I got off uh, of Texture Haven. So let's bring these in. So these are just your uh, kind of your texture set data, the kind of thing that you get from various PBR sources, your, your polygons, your textures, uh, XYZ, textures.com. Mm -hmm. uh, so first things first, it's very important to just make sure that uh, all our scalar channels are tagged as scalar. So this is this will help drive the color management system later in the line, especially that normal map. Yeah. Anything which is data, basically. Exactly. Anything which doesn't need human eye color. That's right. And then your color is going to be color. So what we can do here... So basically everything but the color. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'm just going to zoom in here and start at the top with the base color. And that will be this guy. Drag him in here, get a little tile procedural, plug him in, and that should update the canvas. And you see what we're starting with. Great. There you go. That's your main color to start with. Then go to metallic. I believe this has suspect this. I'm just going to switch this and give this a uh, blank zero value because we don't want any metallicness in oh, this guy here. Oh, a lot of, lot, of, lot of metallic in leaves and dirt. No. That's this How did this work? No, dirt there. And there. And let's start using subsurface. Spec there, we have a map for that. So plug that in. Roughness, which one's roughness? That's AO, uh, that's roughness there. I love texturing when it's just like plug and play. <laughs> yeah. And see, as, as I keep adding these things, you see the uh, shaders updating here mm. in, the, in the view. Let's that's in, uh, shop it. And get down clear coat, clear coat, gloss, and the occlusion. We have one of those. Plug them in. And what's this one over here? That is just placement. I'll skip that for now. Uh, normal, here we go. So here's the normal, plug it in. I think definitely have a bump here somewhere. That's a bump, yeah, cool. So, uh, Mari, you can uh, use both normal and bump, and then the shaders mix them together at the end. And then displacement. That is that one there. That one isn't connected to the shader, but we'll just look it up anyway. So, this is, uh, these are all the images just uh, brought in here. So. As such, now I go to the, uh, the actual material uh, properties, which are uh, this guy, the, the, the top level group. Mm -hmm. I go to this little P button here, and this is uh, for picking uh, attributes from below uh, to expose them as knobs on the main gizmo. Ah. So essentially, the material system is uh, our gizmo system kind of promoted to, to basically package things as materials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Between the gizmos and the materials is that the material is actually going to uh, package up the source images uh, as well as the, the node network, which uh, the gizmo system does not. That only does the node system. So what I'm doing here is I'm going through and picking all the repeat uh, attributes of each of the tile procedurals, and I'm going to promote them to the surface so you can access them on the node. So now you see them all here, they all expose. But what I actually would really want to do is I want one control for all of it. So I can go and select them all in this in the the knob uh, knob uh, control, hit link and say this is my tile repeat. That's cool. Now I have one control hmm. which controls it all. And as you can see here. Ah sick. Very cool. Seems like a very powerful system which you can really customize and in exactly. Crazy ways. So the whole idea is to have whatever you want inside. So I can go in here actually and say, you know what, I'm just going to be really crazy and add a uh, an HSV between the uh, the Whoa. leaf. Crazy <laughs> life. <laughs> HSV uh, adjustment between the two, and I'm going to expose that to my surface here. And so it's a huge shift and saturation and whatnot value as well. So now you can create a lot of quick variations with this material, just, just with the uh, general sliders under the material. Then. That's right. So all of this now is exposed up the top here, and you can do all kinds of crazy things to it. Cool. And uh, once you're happy with your material, so essentially you can uh, boot up any project and do this in Nobra, and at any point go and design a material, 
and then once you're happy with it, go to the node panel here and then export this material. So this is like if you want to make your own custom materials and maybe sell them on a site like the <laughs> <laughs> <You> know, like <laughs> potentially. <laughs> potentially, or you just want to like export it for future projects. Mm. Instead of having like a bunch of attributes, you could just tie them down into one material and just the parameters from there. Yeah, you can create your own library of materials as well. Yeah. It's super easy to texture with. And exactly. That's cool. So what it does here is essentially it creates a screen grab and then exports it to file. So then I can go uh, to another project. So here we go. This is a, a new project. And uh, what I can do here is uh, that the uh, material we basically exported before is now uh, on disk. Uh, I, you can drag and drop them into the shelf. So if I go to my shelf here, there are some I pre prepared earlier at the end here, materials. And these Ooh. are essentially a bunch of the same material that uh, have a bunch of similar kind of materials where their texture sets taken from the internet and packaged up into material and exported. And this is the, how they appear on the shelf. And that just seamlessly just integrates into Mario. Seamlessly integrates into Mario. So we are at kind of the alpha stage of this yeah, moment, yeah. and we only have this working with the node graphs when applying them. But it's kind of the layer system is kind of, I can try to show you where it's going. Yeah. So bear with me a little bit. So uh, start off, uh, here is the uh, all of your channels, which are essentially uh, connected to your principal reading at the end here. And I want to create a merge point for this material. Or let's just say, I want to bring the material in, you just drag it and drop it into the node graph. And then it imports all the images into the uh, image manager and creates an uh, instance of itself. Here, this one I have tile repeat and tile rotation as options. Now to apply it, you need to essentially uh, have a merge point, like a layer, across all of your channels. Mm -hmm. This is where we the, the, shader, the shader model system comes really handy because you have all your channels plugged into a common shader. That drives this, which is a multi-channel merge node, drives how spans and connects to all these sibling channels. So we have one big node which essentially has a merge point for each of the streams. Mm -hmm. And this is then all kind of connected up here uh, through the, has multiple base and overs. So if I uh, zoom in here a little bit, you'll see what I'm talking about. This is such a cool workflow. Uh, so here you see- Predefined materials. Yeah. I love that. So it has all the alphas, the streams, all the base and all the overs. So it's kind of a, an uber merge node. <laughs> mm. And then one thing we did was because this is this is the same shader model as this, it can tell, oh, you're trying to connect one of the same set of edges. Mm -hmm. It batch connects Ooh, the rest. Nice. Very nice. And then you see in the on the model up here, that's gonna get nice and shaded with the material. There it goes. There's metallic. That's a nice metal I grabbed. Iron Man uh, version one. Exactly. The cool thing about about this workflow is that you can just drag and drop materials and just see you set a starting point. Yeah. What a lot of people do, they uh, go like drag and drop. Cool. I'm done. I don't have the texture. <laughs> but uh, if you if you really use this as a starting point, you can create really high quality textures. And quite like, quickly. and let's say you had made a bunch of materi materials in I don't know some kind of other material designer. You could bring that <laughs> all in tomorrow. And start working with that. So absolutely. So what one of the things we're going to have with our first uh, release of the material system is a tool that allows you to ingest any file from disk really simply, where you just say, well, I call my diffuse Alembic or mm -hmm. not Alembic, sorry, uh, Albedo, Albedo. Yeah. or uh, AO is called uh, ambient occlusion or AO, uh, kind of all this kind of pattern recognition where you can sort of set up the template mm -hmm. and say, this is how I call my, my, my textures based on the principle of the F, which is the shade I want to use. Uh, go and scan this folder and turn those all those maps you find into materials. Oh, that's cool. And kind of batch ingest. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it'll work with any uh, kind of uh, texture image file format. So what I've just done here is created another uh, multi-channel merge node, which is automatically chains to the rest. And I'm just going to bring in a second metal here. And uh, what you'll see is if I go grab this guy and again hook him up. That's going to be a complete uh, override. So I'm going to leave the node graph now and see how the layers palette behaves. Right, there's my golden material. Nice, so very here, nice, got a golden iron man. <laughs> so here's like my, two. my base metal, and this would be my gold material. So at this point, I want the gold only to affect some of the model. So mm. I can uh, use the selection group system, which is essentially uh, 
what uh, when you bring in a model from uh, Alembic or uh, or OBJ, if you've got multiple uh, sub objects, yeah. when it merges them all together, it creates selection groups. So this is essentially what the uh, the hierarchy looked like in Maya. Mm. So I can go here and uh, select uh, parts of the mesh. Uh, shift clicking through these uh, aggregates the selection. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if you want to have multiple selections, these are all my ID shielding, what they called it in, in Maya. And uh, now I can go to the layer stack. Uh, so now I have all these selected, I can go to the layer stack and uh, right click on my layer here and go to um, a layer mask, add mask from selection. What this is going to do is use the current selection to build a black and white mask mm. and plug it into this layer. And the, uh, the whole thing with the material layer is that one mask drives all the subsequent channels. So even though each stream is providing its own color or scale data, one mask drives them all to, uh, at one time. So, so this here is kind of like an ID mask in another software, but this is a more flexible way because instead of instead of just like it's a single color, it's actually selecting parts of the model. That's right. And you could go in afterwards and like paint out parts. Yeah. Of the so model let me well. show you that. So here is my model selected. Now I've got the nice the two sections That's of super it. Super cool. And uh, of course, since it is the material, I can go to my uh, let me just collapse this guy here. I can go to my material properties and still adjust those live settings like the mm -hmm. tile amount, a little rotation. That's still all completely live. So here, if I go to this mask and uh, I can do a right click and layer mask, uh, make a mask stack. I can go to this mask stack, and this is essentially a uh, a stack of layers just for the mask. So here's the, the initial of the paint one, which is the kind of ID mask. I can add another paintful layer here. And then I can go uh, with my paint tools and start painting on top mm. of that. Mask stack is one of my favorite features in Mari. It, it's like layer masks in Photoshop, just, just with layers. <laughs> It's so powerful. Adjustment layers, masks, procedurals, anything you want to throw in there. So all this power is, is all, all these materials are driven through this very powerful system. And uh, we had a video once where we called Mari stupid. So now <laughs> you're trying to make Mari smart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to, 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 be, to be fair, like uh, Mari's always kind of uh, relied a lot on the artist to do all the work. Yeah. And that's where this material system, that we're kind of driving Mari more towards a more uh, a, a simpler way of doing high volume of work because in the industry we've seen is uh, the trends are high volume is is, is increasing the amount of, of kind of TV shows at high level yeah. HDR yeah. and 4K TVs the amount of uh, detail and fidelity the textures have to accompany uh, are, are increasing and the amount of, of stuff is increasing the volume so this is all here to kind of drive that but it's essentially making the artist time just more focused on painting textures less on dealing with interface stuff, less That's making right. everything from scratch, like giving them the tools to just get started with texturing like sort of right away. Exactly. So like this, a bunch of, uh, bunch of materials. Uh, uh, this is, of course is our post uh, alpha where we've just got the round trip working. Yeah. We're going to have a so you can drag drop these into the canvas and kind of automatically create that mask for you. Mm, like nice. kind of drag drop ID map type of style. Nice. <clears throat> then that's going to be our first release for our yeah. material system. Going on from that is we're going to introduce a geo channel system where essentially we'll have a, uh, a uh, uh, an image set per object uh, and a read node in the uh, node graph which would read things like object specific maps like curvature, ambient occlusion, or normals. Here that you could uh, bake with the loader render palette or uh, import uh, sequences baked from other applications if you have a preferred method of creating your bake maps. These then could be integrated into materials with a read node, which would be object agnostic. So you could just build your material with, uh, here's a point where the curvature comes in, I'm gonna do some adjustments to it, kind of crank up the, uh, the lookup, uh, create a nice uh, kind of edge mask for your, for your metals. And then uh, when you apply that to your object, mm -hmm. as long as you've got a, a curvature or an inclusion plugged into that object, yeah. they'll just automatically connect up and then automatically drive that material when it's applied. Get allowing us to create much smarter masks and yeah. more kind of layered mask systems. So you have smarter materials, basically. Smarter materials. <laughs> this yeah. is going to speed up particularly hard surface texturing significantly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, once again, I do apologize for my poor laptop <laughs> sporting its uh, Quattro M1000M. 
uh, this thing does look amazing on a much powerful, more powerful graphics card. The frame rate is a lot higher. Yeah, yeah. So one last feature, so to quickly touch on, it's something we added a while back, but uh, it seems to be a little little known feature is our lift uh, function. So uh, here, say for example, you've got a decal, which you want to basically copy around and adjust. Uh, it's sitting on this uh, isolated layer here, but of course the paint buffer uh, doesn't have it. What we can do is you go to the marquee selection tool, which you'll find here, you just uh, drag around this guy, and uh, hit the lift button, which is a little up key. And this essentially adds it to the paint buffer again. So now, it's back in the buffer, I can move the buffer around. Of course, uh, the marquee selection tool is also masking for the paint <laughs> buffer, so if you trash that, it kind of goes away. So here it is. Oh, that's cool. You can move it around, uh, do, all that's the, uh, so cool. do all the things you do with it. And this was uh, the old uh, quick unproject before, or regular unproject. That was, that was a hassle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is something you want to do so often. So here is that literally you can uh, sort of do this once in the buffer, and you can add a new layer, hide the one below, and then essentially you've uh, made a change. Mm. Very nice. This was always a specific case where this was exactly what you're showing. You need to move something around. Precisely. You, you have a bit of text or something. It's on a layer. You got to move it. Or, or simply like if you want to just uh, uh, just do like that again. Uh, da -da -da. Lift it and uh, kind of hide the previous layer and delete the marquee selection and then go to the warp tool because you know what it wasn't quite in line with what I was wanting to work with there. And, go, uh, and uh, yeah, that that that's that's a bit better. That's, nice. that's what I was after. <laughs> Perfect. I would also do the most hacky ways of doing this. I would use the clone tool and clone yeah. this into paint buffer. <laughs> yeah. And that's. It's it's dirty beyond anything. So I mean, this is the prime example of how customer feedback came came back to us yeah. and turned into a tool. So essentially, we had uh, we had customers telling us that the toe brush they were using the toe brush to do this exact kind yeah. of cloning the uh, data into the, the into the paint buffer, and they were asking us to make the toe brush work easy, uh, a better way to allow that. We thought, well, wait a second, it's the toe brush isn't the problem here. They're just trying to get stuff in the buffer. Yeah. Let's just do take that part of the toe brush and put in its own separate feature, which is the lift tool. Yeah. And that's how it became a, a feature in Mari. Nice. So customer feedback, we listen to it. We, we take all of it uh, under advisement and uh, basically build our roadmap and have certain priorities. And currently right now, is our material system is the number one feature uh, that we're working on. Mm. But uh, while we were working on that, we did have the ability to drop the, the mirror projection into the system. A nice small ISO feature. So our four two wasn't an enormous release, but it kind of speaks to the kind of cadence that we're trying to uh, trying to get the Mari team to like correct releasing more often, yeah. uh, sm uh, smaller features, bite sized chunks, so we can get to the customers quicker and get feedback and then evolve the features further into further releases. And that's kind of the whole uh, direction that we're taking at the, at the at the foundry. Cool. It really looks like. Uh up to like maybe version 2.5, 2.6, that it was about getting power and getting like being able to do the job. But from here, it's been refined to make the job a lot easier to do, a much, lot smoother. Don't have to have two monitors. <laughs> yes. I <laughs> mean, uh, making Mari uh, easier to use and faster to learn has been our, our prime direction in the last two years. Starting with the Mari 4.0 release and then going into the 4.1 yeah. and the 4.2. 4.1 is all about making the color space system less cryptic. Uh, before, when you switch between two different channels, different color spaces, your color would change. In 4.1, we've changed that, so now your perceptual color is maintained, the values change. And then 4.2, the mirror projection, one of the longest standing requests for the full feature. Yeah. And then <laughs> into the future, into, uh, into the Mari material system. It's all about making Mari easy to use, fast to learn, and just get, get, get to that goal of Mari as a high volume texture painting tool. That's really nice. Cool. Uh, unless you have anything more to add to this, I think we are We're done. done. A very exciting talk about about Mari. Absolutely. I really enjoy this. It's been a lot of this we've uh, we haven't really seen before at all. No. Because uh, it's, it's it might be an alpha or or so many features sort of like they go under the radar and yeah. like you don't yeah, like lift. That's exactly <laughs> it. It's, 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 it's uh, getting, getting it out there. Uh, so besides the material system that I, I demoed, everything else is in Mari four point two. Perfect. Nice. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rory. That's for, an absolute uh, pleasure. Thank you for, for having me on the show. Me. We'll do this again sometime <laughs> when uh, the material one is more. Oh, absolutely! Than, uh, Definitely come back. Show the power of that. I'd love to show it to you guys again. Excellent. Yeah.
Thank cool. you. So if uh, you guys want to see more content like this in the future, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.